So the title of my presentation is A Journey to the Center of the Clouds. Uh, should be quite descriptive. This is uh, kind of a, a story of experience report, if you like, of the journey we've had so far to, uh, towards, our, uh, to, towards taking more advantage of cloud technology. Um, and so a little bit about me. Um, I'm a programmer first, architect second. Uh, I think that's important to, to point out. Um, I like open source and all of, all of these things. I like to make sounds with the guitar. I think that's the best way of describing what I do. Uh, so I, yeah, it's a, it's a varying degrees of playing. And I, I, I remember jo uh, John described George as a, a technical co-chair emeritus, which uh, uh, I am also one of those. Uh, so for the last couple of years, I was technical co-chair for Saturn. So uh, some people may know me from that from the previous years. All right. So this, like I say, we have a lot to go through today. Um, I'm, we're going to go through some of it a bit quickly. But I, I think it's important to have some of, of this common nomenclature in place before we go into the uh, real stuff further down here. And we'll see how deeply we can go into some of these things. But um, let's just take it as it comes, all right? So first of all, there is no cloud, really, right? Well, there is cloud. I, I also brought the T-shirt. If you can see, it's the same thing. Um, it's just someone else's computer. It only means that someone else is doing your infrastructure for you, right? That's the common thing. But there are some important things to know about the cloud. So the characteristics of the cloud um, should be self-service. So you should be able to order it easily. Uh, you should be network accessible, meaning from the inter internet, from some sort of mobile device. It should be multi-tenancy, so you should not be provisioning one box for yourself and only you. Um, elasticity means scalability, as we've heard multiple times this week. Um, and this point about measuring is more about the fact that you pay for what you use, and that's an important uh, factor in, in, in uh, the economy of the cloud. Um, and so it's the service models. That's the second part of the thing I need, think we need to just quickly go through. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. Um, but so for going from the traditional IT where you handle everything yourself to infrastructure as a service where you uh, get the part of the operating system and the stack below from the vendor and then provide the rest yourself to what's more uh, common today as a software as a service. Uh, where you just provide the data and off you go. Um, and of course, most people will be in a landscape here when you're using the cloud, bit of this, bit of that. In Statoil, we have a strategy to go towards the cloud now. So, and, and the, the reason I bring this up is I think many enterprises now, uh, for many years we've been in this mode of being the master of IT operation and we've, we've sort of tried to gather all of the uh, hardware and all of the knowledge in our domain and being the master of that. And, and we are now seeing a move towards this, the master of data and IT service consumption, meaning we want to be able to deliver faster to the business. So the focus now is much more about delivering the value to the business, much more than it used to be. Um, and so that's why I bring this up. It's quite, quite important for us that we, we are here and we, we want to move in that direction going forward. Um, and of course, this cloud stuff has some benefits. Um, I mainly like to talk about the, the speed and agility of things and, and in the the theme kind of this week has been experiments and running quick experiments to uh, figure out detailed details of your problem. Um, and I would say the cloud is one of the main um, sort of uh, um, the main ways that you can actually do that, right? So the speed of bringing something up quickly, trying something out, taking it back down again without it costing an arm and a leg, that kind of enables us to do this quick experimentation that we need to in this day and age. Um, and also, from an enterprise perspective, it's kind of this increased utilization of IT people as well. Um, I think for us that mainly means focusing them away from operating complex machinery to delivering business to the, de delivering value to the business. That's the kind of 
the way we, we look at it. But with every good thing comes some risks. I'm not going to belabor this very much, but it's important, at least for us, to show that we, we are looking at the downsides as well of, of, uh, of the cloud, and especially this, this with, with data security and, and keeping our data safe. Uh, for many enterprises, the, the data is there, the gold, and we, we want to keep it safe. We don't want it, want it to get uh, uh, <clears throat> into competitors' hands, for instance, or, or uh, stuff like that. So, so we need to keep our data safe. Um, from the enterprise IT organization's point of view, this point about shadow IT can be dangerous. Uh, I actually think it's a benefit sometimes. I mean, we were talking yesterday about, or, or on Tuesday, about this uh, uh, putting more power in the hands of the end user. Um, some people can see that as a risk, but, you know, uh, all in the point of view, I guess. All right. So, I call what we've done a gamble. And the reason why I do that is because we started this journey without having any real business case for what we were doing. There were no customers knocking on our door saying, we need a cloud platform. Um, so this was kind of a way for the IT department to say, we, we need to get ready for the future. We, need, and we were able to convince the business that we need to do this in order to be prepared. Um, and, and this is kind of the, the reasoning we, we, we used to make them um, back us on this. So traditionally, we have all of these vendor systems that basically lock down the data in different silos. Um, and we're more or less um, dependent on the vendors to define the data models, to define the data access mechanisms, all of this. Um, in the, at the best case, we get an Oracle database, which we can query for some data, right, in, in some ways. So what we thought we'd do is we'd try to make a data platform on top of this that can orchestrate the data um, across these different silos um, and, and basically help us get control of our data. Uh, so someone mentioned it's good to have designers uh, this morning in slide roulette, so yeah, we have those. Um, so the vision behind this is to, to try and extract the data from all the different lockdown silos, get, gather them together in a data lake. Now, this has been made by people who don't really understand what a data lake is, right? So don't think Hadoop in this case. It's like, more like a platform where we gather data. Using the data lake as the technical solution is not really the point. Um, but anyway, gathering the data together uh, being able to look across different data sources, combine the data, that's kind of the vision. And of course, as a big company, we have a lot of, oops, I have a lot of vendors. Um, we deal a lot with big um, companies like Schlumberger, like uh, Halliburton Landmark, we deal with uh, GE. Uh, Kongsberg for uh, real-time data. We deal with SAP, of course. We're a large enterprise after all, and we've got to have SAP. All of these uh, have their own platforms. Some of them are now on-premise. Some of them will be in the cloud shortly, um, and we need a way to integrate with all of these as well. So, so that's also a play uh, that we saw coming for the data platform to be able to help us integrate with all of these external uh, companies. So. A little bit about the journey and the architecture. After all, we are an architecture conference, so we cannot avoid that. Um, we need to focus most on, mostly on the architecture here. Uh, but before we do, uh, this is kind of repetition for people who have been here previous years. We have had this slides before, but it's just to show oops, the, the number or the, or the magnitude of a data we have in the company, right? So uh, this is talking about the offshore installations we have. We have about 20, 30 of these, um, 500 gigabytes a day per turbine, so there are multiple turbines, uh, readings per second, historical data, blah, 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 lots of data. That's the bottom line. Um, also, recent trend is not just to do seismic surveys once every three years, which we used to do, but now they've actually put in place permanent seismic grids on the surface of the North Sea, gathering data multiple times a year, um, basically increasing the data many-fold. Um, oops, I keep clicking too much. Okay, so 
you see 32 terabytes per survey, one gigabyte every 10 seconds. Yeah, as you can imagine, huge amounts of data. So we need to, to figure out how to deal with this. Basically, our, our on-premise storage also were exhausted. So we need, we need somewhere else to put these data. Um, this is kind of an example of, the, of a field of the future where we have more distributed uh, ways of gathering data. We see uh, airplanes gathering some seismic data here. We have ships uh, drilling, making data as they drill, and so forth. So what type of architecture can we create to deal with this? There is multiple data sources, right? We have here the IoT, the plant, the real-time data. We have the current IT platforms, like I showed you in the previous picture, the business-specific systems here. Uh, these are some names that we have internally and don't really need to care about those. Um, and this new data platform that we're trying to create. So how do we get data into this platform? For the IoT and uh, plant and the real-time data, there's basically just two ways of doing that. You can either batch load it or you can stream it directly. Um, and in the end, it turns out you need to do a combination of both because we have, like I say, historical data here. There's many, many terabytes of data. You cannot uh, feasibly start streaming all of that. You need to uh, maybe do some batch loading, maybe even do offline batch loading, for instance, uh, uh, I mean, both Amazon and, and, and Microsoft now provide these huge containers that you can just fly to your data centers, plug them in, load data up, and fly them to wherever they need to go and load the data up in the cloud. Um, and then you can start streaming after that, right? So for the, all, the new, all the new stuff you stream. For the business-specific systems, you can either have APIs, so modern systems will typically provide you with APIs. You can even build APIs yourself on top of database access or whatever you want. Um, you can do data virtualization solutions, um, systems like uh, Landmarks, uh, Openworks, and EDM. They come with their own data virtualization solution that you can plug in and use for data transfer. You can do replication, so if you have for instance, an Oracle database you built yourself and have full access to, you can easily replicate that into the cloud to a database there. And for file systems, you basically parse and replicate the data directly off your file system. Now, in theory, this sounds quite simple, but uh, if you paid close attention before, you saw we have data from the last 40 years, and that means multiple formats, uh, especially for the file systems, we have files that no one really knows how to read anymore. And so there is a number of these things you need to solve. Uh, uh, so pictures, like we say in architecture, pictures may be pretty, but they always hide a much more dark uh, story. Um, but this is only part of the, part of the picture. And I, and I usually say this is the simple part. So getting the data from our current systems, even the streaming part, this, this kind of real-time continuous streaming, is really the simple part. Uh, the, the, the really difficult thing is this layer here. And, and you see the, <laughs> it's kind of um, uh, deceptively simple <laughs> in the picture again. But agreeing on APIs and how do you really design this, these APIs that are gonna be used by the application layer above, that, that is really, really, really the hard part. And we've just started this journey, and I hope to be able to get more into detail about this uh, in the coming years. But I must say that the, in the enterprise, the fight between, and I'll come a little bit back to this in the, when I talk about enterprise data modeling, the fight between wanting a big enterprise data model and going specifically case to case and looking real in, into domain driven design and those types of practices is hard in the enterprise because people do want this big shiny one fits all model which is completely irrational but you know um, so like I say this is the hard part and we're starting to look into this and we really think that a case by case basis here where we uh, where we go out find the needs of individual business clients uh, or business users in, at, the, at the sharp end of the business and try to solve their problems 
and that leads to these APIs, and it also affects what we, what we transfer here. A bit like Matthias was saying, you, you look at the needs and you transfer in the data that's needed uh, as a case-by-case -case basis. Of course, any cloud solution with the respect for themselves has some analytics in it. Um, and this is, of course, a big selling point for management to saying that now you've got access to this huge pile of data, <laughs> right? That's how they see it. Uh, we have all the data now, what can we do with it? Come on, let's get some ideas flowing. So machine learning, uh, different types of analytics, that's pretty big at the moment. Um, and and uh, to be fair, they have gotten a lot of progress on that in Statoil. Uh, I would say we are, we are very, f uh, I mean, we, we have been working with stuff like IBM Watson, different types of AI solutions over the years and hats haven't really made progress now until, until recently when, when more data has become available. So I really do think that uh, data access is one of the big success factors in making AI work for you. Um, that's one of, the, one of the main things we've learned anyway. So there's more in this picture, of course. Um, like I mentioned, we have a lot of vendors and they are all moving to one cloud solution or another. Um, the typical trend in the market that we see now is that, like us, most vendors try to make their own cloud, more own cloud platform, I should say. Um, so people like Schlumberger, Baker Hughes, uh, Halliburton, which is other, other big service companies that we use in the oil industry, they have their own clouds. Uh, Kongsberg, which is the big real-time player at the moment, real-time data player, they have their own cloud, SAP, other ERP vendors, Oracle is a big cloud company as well. So everything is going towards the cloud. And like Owen was saying this morning, the vendors want to control the platform. So they will, send you a, uh, they will sell you a platform in order to try and lock you in. And this is our main goal at the moment, to try and stay away from the lock-in of the vendor. Um, so... Uh, I think we need some kind of industry collaboration in this area to, uh, to avoid that because the, the service companies are very, very uh, powerful in our industry. But anyway, we, we are looking into patterns here for, for uh, uh, integrating our, our uh, third-party clouds, cloud platforms. And the way we're thinking of, using, uh, of doing that is by using the APIs uh, as well. So, so this API layer here will be two-way also accepting data in that way um, and potentially giving data back. Um, so th we've drawn SAP down here, we've drawn Schlumberger, Halliburton and the others down here, but the same principle applies that it goes through an API uh, specifically for that uh, interaction. Uh, that's kind of the pattern we've chosen. Um, and in addition to that, there is a lot of uh, special projects. So these are construction, construction projects uh, or exploration projects, different special projects that we have that will also maybe need their own data uh, platforms because they are either uh, be because of the partnerships we have or the special nature that they have. Maybe they are smaller. Maybe there are experiments, again, in the, on the business side. Um, and, th oh, and they can also be then integrated through... Uh, the APIs like this. So I, that's kind of the, the way we look at the architecture at the moment. And we are in talks with several of our uh, industry uh, peers. So people like Shell, BP, and others um, to see if we can agree on kind of a standard way of organizing our data platform so that we can have a more or less a common front against our, our vendors in a way. So that's, uh, that's, gonna, that's gonna be an interesting development to see how that goes. So we have of course some experiences that we've uh, gone through and I wanna show you a little bit more concretely what we've done. Um, so this is, this is a more detailed picture of the same architecture. Um, what we have done here is we, we show the, uh, the systems here on the, on the, on the bottom, and the file systems, um, data virtualization technologies, and then 
how the structure we what what's the structure like within the cloud platform. Um, so you can say all above here is the is the cloud platform, and here we are starting to see the outlines of what's going to be the APIs uh, on top of the data model. Um, so I think we, we are following what's what's typically a, a, a three-tier or multi-tier data layer model in the in the platform. Uh, so we have a, a raw layer where we put all the all the formats from the from the systems, um, typically taking the vendor models, just dumping them in, uh, and then we do some transformations. Um, it can be quality assurance, things like that. Uh, so this is basically a data cooking metaphor. So you, so you, so you have the raw ingredients on the bottom, and you will have the prepared uh, results on top here, um, taking basically a, a, a multi-step approach to, to, uh, and, and utilizing the power of the cloud uh, to do different uh, quality checks uh, and transformations, and maybe even augmentation of the data in order to make it suitable for consumption. Um, typically, a, a typical example that we run into straight away is we, we, we drill wells. So that's the primary data object we have. It's a, it's a well, it's a hole in the ground, it has different, different characteristics. This well object is comprised from data from here, from here, from here, and from here, and obviously from here, this is called WellDB. So we need to take some parts of the data from many of these different systems and building it into one more consumable uh, item on the top. Um, and as you can imagine, this is context um, dependent as well. So it's not just one well for every purpose. It's a uh, uh, it's context dependent, so you need to take into account whether you are looking at the, the well from a reservoir management context, which are a, this is a kind of simplified view of the well as a transport mechanism, transporting the oil from the bottom of the of the hole to the top of the hole, or if you look for a, from a drilling perspective, where you need to look at individual sections and how long it took to drill the individual sections because you want to measure that, and, and so there's many different um, different aspects to a well which makes it more complex than, than just a simple case. Um, and as you can see, there is multiple of these data items that we need to deal with um, in this, uh, what we call a subsurface model. And then of course, the question becomes on top of that, how do you serve that data efficiently to a set of applications on top? Uh, now, we are not in any shape or form uh, a Google or a, or a Facebook or someone that needs to serve thousands of users. We, m we might have 100 users on a good day, right? Um, so so that we don't have those scalability issues. Our issues is more getting the data, uh, the huge amounts of data right, and filtering it for the individual users. So I would say our our, our problems here are not that big, the big problem is finding and sorting the data, getting it in the right shape here. Um, and we need to decide whether we need these, these data stores, uh, call them caches or whatever you like, up there to, to speed things up. We, we might be able to, to do without them. And if we can do without them, of course, things will be simpler from a, from a maintenance perspective, but we, we're still... Um, experimenting, I would say, a little bit with that to see what, what we actually need here. So, so that's part of the pilot project as well, to find out the, the way, way forward. Another interesting thing, I mean, this is, this is the, the pilot projects are, I would say, very much greenfield applications. We, we go to someone and say, what, what kind of problems do we have today that you don't get solved by anything else? Um, so we build something new, we do a React app, we do this, the whole stack, we're new, so that's fine. But we also have a lot of existing applications, and they are very much a different question, how, what to deal with them. So the one example here is from, uh, from a reporting application we have called uh, uh, Daily Reporting. Uh, it basically it takes a lot of manual input from many different sources, gathering it in a database and providing the views to the users. Um, and so we want to see how we can utilize the cloud to make this application more efficient. The uh, problem with this application is that it has 
lived for many years. It's one of those uh, long-lived ones that uh, Harold mentioned today in the slide roulette. Um, and of course, it has a lot of crud in it. Um, uh, many people want the data from this application, so they, it's very sought after data. Um, and the, the way they've solved that is to put a lot of database views, a lot of uh, integrations directly on the data model. So there's tight coupling from all the integrations to the data model, making it very hard to change over time. We've talked about this application before at Saturn. I think if you go back to, well, that was Baltimore 2015, I think, to, to move this to more microservices architecture. So you can hear more about that if you like. I think now we're at the position to actually do this with the help of the cloud. So the, the whole idea is to try and take some of the integrations we have in this application, um, basically synchronizing the data from this application to the cloud, um, both to do some analytics on it, but also to uh, try and offload all many of the integrations that are, are today uh, belumbering this database uh, and, and sort of uh, keeping the data model uh, static or, or making it difficult to change at the very least. So our, our idea here is to create a two-way mechanism here to, to keep these data models in sync um, and, and then we can start moving integrations to the cloud uh, and especially, of course, starting with the new third-party integrations that come from other cloud systems. Uh, it wouldn't make sense to maybe move the internal integrations at, at, at the start. There's also a lot of data in here that's been, because the, the, the dominating reason have, uh, reasoning has been, if you want to keep data in, in sync, you need to connect it directly to the, to the data model in the database. That's the only way to keep it uh, really uh, connected. And, and you know that we are able today in 2018 to keep things in sync even if they are distributed. So uh, we need to sort of elevate the, the level of thinking a little bit internally towards the, the possibility of being able to store data here that's related to data in here. We can keep that in sync. Uh, but of course, people need to be uh, uh, pr uh, convinced about this, so we need to do some experiments and, and make show them that we can. Over time, we see more of a, a picture like this where um, the cloud lives uh, on, some small part of the system lives on internally, but uh, it's going to be more modularized and some of it's going to be moved out here. Um, so that's the kind of thinking we, we have. Uh, we, we, the reason why we think we need something internally is we have these, um, uh, these data that, that will sometimes have to be streamed uh, internally be more because of the nature of these systems than than anything else. Some of them we can connect directly to the cloud. Some of them we will connect directly to, to third parties, but, but some will still need to be um, internal, for, for at least for a time being. Right, talking about third party cloud integration. We, I don't wanna go into too much about this since we already talked a little about it, but like I said before, we, we see that all of our big uh, vendors are moving to their own cloud platforms. Some are more, more, more mature than others. Without going into detail about that, we have companies like uh, Ulia Soft, which is a small company um, that have been working on the cloud platform since 2015. So, so they are more mature, but maybe have less of the um, service breadth. Um, while these others have all the, all the functionality, but maybe less of the, of the cloud platform. But we think what we need to have in the future is some way of being able to integrate with these clouds either fully or partly. And, and the ideal situation for us would be to be able to pick a service here, pick a service there and, and here, and combine them uh, for our own purposes. Uh, now, of course, this is not what the vendor wants, so that's why we are talking about um, uh, maybe doing a collaboration in the industry to, to, to have a bit more uh, common front against them. We'll see. Um, and so we're back to these funny big diagrams, but again, this is the APIs, just to, just to, just to show how we think that these, these will, will be integrated. Um, 
There is an IoT component as well uh, with, with uh, communication to, our, uh, to the third party clouds and, and then services to us. Um, the blue and the green here is what are provided by the vendors, what are provided by us. So we can see both of us providing APIs basically. That's what this, uh, this figure is saying. And so we come to the fun part of enterprise data modeling. Um, of course, I, I guess this is fairly familiar to most people who have worked with big companies. Um, there are challenges in, in this area. Uh, there is huge amount of data, very big uh, models. And again, we talk about this multiple sources of data, uh, different data ecosystems and lack of common terms and everything like that. So, so what we are trying to do is to gather everything in a, in a and, and sort of get control of our, our um, nomenclature or, or, uh, or the words. So we have different tools for this that we are trying to establish. Um, and some of these I like better than others, I would say, but, but this, I, I think all is done in, 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 in a good effort and, and uh, um, hopefully we can steer this in a good direction as we move along. Um, so especially this data catalog, um, this, this idea looks very much like the one Matthias just showed, uh, listing the types of data, the categories, and then what types of data is available in, in each category, what do they mean. Um, and of course it's connected to um, uh, information inventory and, and a glossary that defines the terms. So, so we actually have a, a separate department working on this uh, and organizing it. We have a long history of trying to keep our data uh, straight. The, the, the problem is we have also a history of being very much influenced by the vendor market in what we call the, the different uh, data. So, so uh, that's one thing. We are trying to work with international standards. We have, we have a long history uh, with the standards body called Energistics, um, where we develop a, a standard called BitsML for real-time data. Um, that's one of our ours. Um, and what we're trying also to do is to have this enterprise data model and the meta metadata model uh, to basically show people that on a, on a very high level, if you're dealing with well data, what other data is that connected to? What, where will it um, uh, influence others when, when, you, when you change something? So this is a, I think this is a pretty powerful tool as long as you don't try to uh, take it too far. Uh, so there's a difference between using a data, enterprise data model f for architectural purposes and using an enterprise data model uh, to force an implementation in a, in a detailed software architecture in a system. Uh, so we need to be very careful that we also, um, so here is, our, here is our fantastic enterprise data model version one. Yeah, just wanna leave that there for a second. Nice colors like we talked about this morning. Yeah, yeah, good. Uh, but the important thing is that we don't forget when it comes to implementation, there is something called domain-driven design. And I think this is where sometimes we fall down a little bit in this, this data uh, management department that we have. I don't think they know enough and nearly enough about this type of thing. So making context maps, especially con bounded context and all of these patterns that, that Eric Evans have, have taken, uh, taken um, up. And the, the reason why is that, uh, we were talking about this last night actually, um, I think the reason why this happens is because most of the people working in enterprise data modeling, they come from the business analyst side. They're not software developers. Um, and domain-driven design is something that's really, really, really geared towards software developers. So, so this is a, an area where I think it's very important that software developers, that sort of architects that are software developers first, like me, get together with the business analysts and uh, we, that we can agree and basically share information about how to do this thing. How does the uh, domain-driven design concepts fit with the enterprise data model? How do you map from one to the other? Uh, and, and that's what I mean by this is, this is where really the, the, the battle is won, I think. Um, and of course, this relationship between the different contexts, how to, how to maintain this, 
uh, because it's very, again, it's very easy to say, okay, we have this huge data model on top, we have all these detailed models uh, in, in the implementations that maybe are documented somewhere, but I don't think anyone has this translation map anywhere, right? So, so who knows how, maybe there's one guy over there that knows how to translate between those two. Uh, and so this is kind of a, an important thing for me personally, at least, to, to put in. And finally, the, 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 the last part of this, which I think uh, I want to show you because I think it's a really, really positive improvement from w how we used to work, is this the sign thinking methodology that we are, are now starting to, to use. So we are putting the, the user in focus. We are going out to the end user saying, what problems do you have today that no app is solving for you? Um, really visiting them at their site, looking at their work processes, being really into what they do, uh, not just to understand, but also to see, uh, because sometimes they, they think they have problems that they don't, right? So, so uh, it's like this, this overquoted thing about wanting a faster horse when really what you need is a car. Um, but but it, that's so often true, right? You, you come to them and see that, yeah, this is what you think you need, but, but really when you dig a little bit deeper, it's not that you want this form in an iPad. You need basically to us to change the whole process, or we can at least do that when we look a little bit further into what you're doing. Um, and again, this experimentation idea where you want to take something and build it quickly, show it to them, and that's when you get the real good ideas, when you take this first thing that they thought they needed and say, so, oh, but if we can do that, then we can do this, and then we can op optimize that. Basically taking the whole application portfolio to a, a, a whole nother level. And I think, in my mind, this is really what um, now couples the agile approach to the more architectural thinking that we, we used to have. Um, and I must admit, I, I'm the first to admit that, that you know, we, we struggle a lot with fitting some of the agile ideas into the uh, architectural thinking and how much to do upfront, how much control to keep. Um, like I was showing this big architecture picture and these are the ways into the platform and these are the ways out of the platform and, and all of this and we, how much do you put the brakes on when someone wants to do something cool? Um, and I mean we have people at, uh, for, uh, at Stato working with HoloLens and been working with that for many years and, and all they're missing is the data, right? So, so they can do cool things as long as they can get the data in the, in the glasses. Um, and these type of thing, you want to cheer them on, you want to help them build the stuff, but you also want to make the systems robust and, and the whole architecture fit together. Um, and, and so, I'm, I'm sorry that I don't have any answers to you on that one, but we, we really do struggle with it and, and we'll be working in, in the years to come to, to uh, get some answers on that and hopefully we'll be back uh, uh, another year to maybe share some more, uh, more good stuff on that. So, I think actually that was it for me. Uh, I see now we're approaching uh, lunch. There is uh, five or six minutes left. Um, but let's go through a little bit more as a summary, the, the learnings that we've done. Uh, so, like I say, getting the data out of the legacy systems, it's not as difficult as we, as we initially expected. Some, like I said, the legacy formats, they can be tricky. Um, we have some examples of some binary formats that are poorly documented. We need to basically experiment with it. And if you solve one, then you can bet that from the 100 files, there are at least two or three that don't match that. And you know, all the fun to be had there. So like I said, the real challenge is to agree on the APIs and the data models, um, especially this, this dichotomy between doing big da enterprise data models and the detailed uh, models on, on the, on, in the software systems um, with, with domain-driven design. I mean, we even 
I would say have some problems getting the developers sometimes to, to pick up on the domain driven design ideas, so we're far from perfect in that respect. This bottom up versus top down design of, of APIs, um, it's a bit of a challenge because we, 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 we try to do the whole we try to do slices through the whole stack, like, like James Lewis was talking about. Uh, make a thin slice, make it, make it work in the entire stack, um, and then uh, expand on it from different cases. But the discipline of doing that is hard. Uh, making it fit together, uh, making sure you do all the refactorings, all the changes, all the stuff that's going on, it's, it's hard. So. If we could do a top down, of course, it would be much easier, but we, we, uh, we realize we're not that smart, so hope that's, that's a good thing, I think. So, and then introducing the DDD concepts to the enterprise data modelers is important, uh, but we shouldn't forget the software developers, of course, they, they also need this. Um, and then the design thinking to, to actually solve the real, real problems we have and put the user first. That's also a big, big. Uh, Part of this. So with that, I think we have a little bit of time for questions if you have them. Of course, the, the, the easy answer is yes, all of the above. Uh, but, but of course, the main thing is when you, when you, everyone can agree that we need a well. That's a data object, so no one disagrees on that. But then, depending on the context, you need different elements in there. And, and the attributes is different depending on the context. Uh, so that's why they have only the top level in the enterprise model, and they leave all the details to the, to the, uh, in initial or the individual implementations. Of course, the relationship between well and field and uh, all the other parts is also something we disagree on sometimes. Uh, so the relationships can be hard to figure out as well. But, but, but that's more of a, uh, someone from up high can sort of dictate that that's how it should, that's how it should be in the data model and, and then you're fine. So that's more of a top-down kind of thing. Anyone else? Everyone's hungry? <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.